Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. They said we're gonna put a play together Though we don't know yet what it's about We'll let everybody be in it So that there's no one left to be in the crowd No, you think I'm wasting time here Not sculpting up an image to play This is my last letter Welcome, everybody, to the first of our decade recaps of Schumacast, where we're looking through the film career of Joel Schumacher. I am Noel, and joining me as always... I'm Angie. We wanted to just take a little break here between the films. We just wrapped up all of Joel's work in the 70s, and we just kind of wanted to have a little look back overview at the decade as a whole. We're not going to get too much into the individual films themselves. We have all the episodes available on the site, so you can absolutely go back and give those a listen if anything sounds more interesting that you want to learn more about. We hope that you're listening to every episode anyways, right? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) You wouldn't skip, would you? This isn't a cheat sheet. Right? Right? (laughs) (laughs) I think we'll just start by just doing a real quick rundown of the 70s for Joel and came up as a fashion designer in the 70s, worked in the fashion industry. In the early 70s, moved to Hollywood, started doing costumes. His first one was played as it lays. Now, I know, Angie, you didn't watch. Have you still not watched any of the costume designer films? Unfortunately, no, I haven't had the time to check them out yet. Played as it lays, a 70s melodrama I did not recommend. Then there was the 1973 mystery, The Last of Sheila, which he also did costumes for. I did recommend that. Mm-hmm. That, one, that one is absolutely worth checking out. Then the 1973 romance drama Bloom and Love, which was abhorrent. Well made, (laughs) Mm, but abhorrent. Yeah, I remember that one. Oh, yeah. And then the 1973 film Sleeper, which probably his most striking costume design work, just Mm -hmm. because he got to do a sci-fi movie. That one I recommended, but with the Woody Allen caveat of it's a Woody Allen movie. Right. And that's not something that everyone's going to want to see. Yeah. And then the 1974 TV movie The Killer Bees, which was about (laughs) killer bees... And Bees Who Killed People. (laughs) It had its charms. It had its Z-grade movie charms, but I did not recommend it. It was not a good movie. Yeah. But then that led us to our first main episode, the 1974 TV movie Virginia Hill about the gangster girlfriend slash fiance of Bugsy Siegel and, and their attempts to create Las Vegas. Yes. And was this one that you recommended, Angie? No, I don't believe so. Yeah, I did not either. Just one of those kind of... Yeah. Bland. It was Joel's directorial debut, his first produced screenplay, and was just very obviously done on the cheap. Right. (laughs) Very good way to get his foot in the door, but not making a mark just yet. Right. Definitely, as you said, humble beginnings. Yes. And then he did some more costume design work with the 1975 film The Prisoner of Second Avenue, which was a Neil Simon comedy about a couple in New York. That one I definitely recommend it. Very good Mm -hmm. comedy. And then 1976 also saw the filming of Joel's very first screenplay, Sparkle, a Motown musical drama about three sisters trying to rise to the ranks of the music industry. And Angie, did you recommend this one? I did not recommend this one. I felt like it needed an extra rewrite or two to really get there. I did recommend it. It was wobbly, a little rough, but I still thought there was enough there that I really appreciated and enjoyed. Mm Mm-hmm. And then for this one, we did also cover the 2012 remake. Yes. Did you recommend that? I liked that one much better. I agree too. Even though I recommend both, I think the 2012 one is a much stronger movie overall. And then the 1976 ensemble Car Wash, about people in a car wash. (laughs) Did you recommend that? I'm trying to remember. I don't think I did. But it did have a lot of charm to at least some of the characters and scenes. So now I'm kind of like, maybe I should have recommended it. I don't know. (laughs) Well, I remember you were thrown a bit just because you weren't used to that kind of slice of life. Right. Yeah. It's never been my favorite kind of film for sure. Yeah. And I highly recommended it. I think everything came together for me. But granted, I'm more used to that style. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then in 1978, he did his last film as a costume designer with the Woody Allen drama Interiors, which, Mm. again, very well-made movie, but has the Woody Allen caveat. Right. Though it has the bonus that Woody Allen's not in it, so you don't have to see him. (laughs) And then the sweeping blockbuster spectacle musical that terribly bombed The Wiz. (laughs) It was a very, very loose adaptation of the Broadway play that Joel wrote the adaptation of. Did you recommend The Wiz? I did not pay 
pacing was definitely the main villain for me this time. Right. I did recommend it because there was a lot of inventiveness to it, but oh, the pacing was bad. Yeah. That pacing was really bad. Finally, wrapping up the decade, we had the 1979 TV movie Amateur Night at the Dixie Bar and Grill, which I would argue is the first true Joel Schumacher movie because he got to direct his own story. It was his own original story. I think this is the nice stepping stone to end the decade on as we're moving in the next decade. Mm -hmm. Did you recommend Amateur Night at the Dixie Bar and Grill? I initially didn't, but then by the end of the discussion, I was like, wait, no, I do kind of like this movie. <laughs> Because it is very charming. What's interesting is we end the decade on, I would actually almost say, Humble Beginnings again. Mm -hmm. This was his first true film, and it was charming. Yeah, I'd agree. So now, looking at the decade as a whole, now, it's kind of hard to say if this was like a big successful decade for him, because it's literally a whole decade of him gradually getting up the steps to where he can finally become a... F his end goal is to become a filmmaker, and that's where we're going to start the next decade on. Right. What did you think of the last decade in terms of just kind of seeing him go up those steps? I think there was definitely a little bit of shakiness in the beginning. Like I said, Virginia Hill being very much bland by the numbers, Sparkle having a little weakness there. But I think as the time went on, you could kind of see that his writing was growing. Like, Amateur Night is certainly not a cinematic spectacle or anything like that, but it's definitely a competent, charming little film. So you can definitely see him grow over that time period. Mm -hmm. And I can see how this could lead him to making feature films. Yeah, and it's interesting, again, seeing the unusual angle that he came into the industry from. Mm -hmm. You know, again, starting with the costume designs and working his way in. It's interesting that a lot of the films that he ended up making so far are not ones that I would call like fashion spectacles. Right. None of his films are about the fashion industry or fashion or anything no. like that. He's very much doing films about people who aren't him. Right. Yeah. Not just because a lot of the films are about black culture, mm -hmm. but I mean, Amateur Night at the Dixie Bar and Grill, exploring you know, like a small Southern bar, mm -hmm. you know, or rising through the music industry or the fantasy world of Oz. <laughs> <laughs> It's interesting seeing that he's a storyteller of perspective. Right. Especially with Amateur Night. Yeah. It seemed like he really made a point to present all these different perspectives of these kind of small town people. And that was really a nice touch. Yeah, I think that's a good through line through the films that he wrote. Mm -hmm. He's very good at building a community. Yes. Finding a setting and populating that setting with people who explore all the various people of that setting. Mm -hmm. I think Virginia got away from him because it was too sprawling of a story to really work with that style. Yeah. But I mean, even Sparkle is a very tight cast just kind of showing the rise through the music industry. It didn't quite have all the mechanics down yet, but mm -hmm. Car Wash, very much showing all these people around one community. Amateur Night showing that mm -hmm. even the whiz to a degree even though it's a fantasy world and everything is more representative of a theme right it was still interesting in how it had all these characters populate that theme yes yes i think the other thing with virginia hill too to remember is he was technically going you know someone else started that script right and he may not have had much freedom to play with it to begin with to me, that seems more like just a job. It's the way to get the directing credit on your resume so you can keep going right. than any kind of expression of his own work. I'm betting his rewrite on that was probably more sprawling. We don't have the money for it. We got to cut it down. Right, right. It doesn't feel like a film that anyone's particularly invested in. It's like, hey, it's a foot in the door movie. Yeah. Whereas I think even things like Sparkle, I think it's a story that has a lot of genuine heart and investment to it. Mm -hmm. But again, he just didn't quite have the technique down. Right. Wasn't really paired with the best director. You know, Carwa. I still think him and Michael Schultz clicked really well in that cast. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know it didn't have as strong of a plot through line, but yeah. I really like seeing the development of how he'll literally just root into a location and find all these people within it, even though they're people who are outside of his life experience. Right. That alone makes me curious to go on and see more of his films. Mm -hmm. How is he going to keep building on that style and technique? Question for you, since you watched all those other movies, do you think he learned anything? I guess, can you see any similarities between those films that he worked on as costume designer versus these? Like, maybe he was learning anything about technique or anything? I'm just curious, like, if there's any similarities there. Probably the closest, actually, I would say, is Prisoner of Second Avenue. Okay. Because it's very much a story about people and their environment mm -hmm. and surrounded by a cast that fleshes out that environment. Right. It's more grounded. It's witty, but it's also grounded and has drama and dramatic punches. Mm. 
Uh, I, oh, I hesitate to say Bloom and Love. Uh, <laughs> I know one of his biggest influences is Robert Altman, who he never worked for. Oh, okay. Robert Altman with films like MASH and Nashville. Mm, that makes sense, yeah. Big ensemble pieces where it's literally get people who are just surrounding this one centralized community. Right. But, I mean, the difference is, is that Altman, his films were largely improvised. He would just film a whole bunch of improvised stuff and then gradually build it together into a movie and editing. Gotcha. Joel is... I think surprisingly adept at actually just, because as we said, Car Wash, surprisingly, very little of that film was improvised, even though it feels like a film where a lot of that could have been improvised. And even The Wiz, very little of that was, almost all of that came straight out of his script. Right. It's interesting how he's able to make something that feels kind of natural and flowing just by writing it. Mm -hmm. Again, I came out of this decade really, really liking him as a writer. I just want to <laughs> see what more he does as a writer. Yeah. That's where I kind of feel bad. We only have like a handful of films in the 80s that he wrote before he just started it's working with other writers. I'm curious to see if that's going to affect the storytelling in his films or if he's still going to find ways to bring that sensibility while working with other writers. Right. Okay. And are there any other like similar themes or stylistic things that leap out at you? Obviously, the main thing is that whole ensemble cast idea. I can't think of anything else. I mean, there was a lot of music. I guess that's for sure. Oh, yeah. Like, he's definitely a music fan. Well, I think that's because Motown produced like four. <laughs> that <laughs> does help. Yes, <laughs> that's very true. But I think it definitely means that he's drawn to music and as a fan, and I know he'll eventually be doing some music videos as well. So that'll be interesting to see. Yeah. And what's interesting, though, to be fair, a lot of those are music videos that are tied directly to the movies. Sure. And yeah, it helped that a lot of those he could just film on the set. Mm -hmm. But no, just to build on what you said, we also noticed like in Virginia Hill, it was a very clumsily directed movie mm -hmm. it was capable but falling to the floor and dropping the ring right but i think amateur night showed a much better comfort with directing even though it's still not a film that i would say have many directorial flourishes it's still shot in a very grounded very mm -hmm. i don't want to say basic in a derogatory term but just basic in terms of you know you got your medium shots your wide shots your medium shots wide shots there's right. nothing He's not like doing this Spielbergian Peter Jackson thing of like all these shots that literally like flow from each other, like literally pulling you through his sequence. Right. Which I'm not criticizing him. Yeah. I actually think Car Wash had quite a bit of that, but it's just going to be interesting to see the continual evolution because I want to say the only like real stylistic directorial flourish I can think of between those two movies are the one scene in Amateur Night at the Dixie Bar and Grill where the waitress goes up to sing to Cowboy and it's just slowly pushing in on her from across the entire bar from her and then gradually just pushes it into a close-up. I just thought that was a very simple shot, but I just thought it was delivered in a really skilled way. Yeah. I'm going to be curious to see how well he handles like environment and moments and emotion and all that stuff. Right. And with a film budget too, of course, that's going to be yeah. a big difference as well. Definitely. So anything else that you're looking forward to moving on to the next decade? You know, a lot of those Brat Pack films, some of them I've seen before, some of them I've heard of for ages but never got to see. I'm a fan of 80s films in general, so I'm just looking forward to checking a lot of these out. And Incredible Shrinking Woman is something I have fond memories of as a kid, so it'll be great mm -hmm. to revisit that. Yeah, I'm just, I don't know, I'm just looking forward to checking them all out. Yeah, I'm going to be very curious to see the Brat Pack ones too, because most of my Brat Pack experience is through the John Hughes side. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I've seen any of the Schumacher ones. Okay. Not even Lost Boys, huh? Yeah. Even though I know his three Brat Pack movies I know are considered to be pretty significant ones. I mean, not only Lost Boys, but St. Elmo's Fire. Right. And even Flatliners is one of the later era Brat Pack movies. I haven't seen any of those. So it's going to be interesting to get into that decade where he really took off. Mm -hmm. I'm really curious to see where we keep going with this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, anything else you want to add? I can't think of anything else. Again, as you said, humble beginnings. I think I'm much more warmly embracing that <laughs> than I was at Virginia Hill. Right. It was really interesting getting to see this start to his career. And again, coming in from a very unusual angle, but then making some really... He has not yet been involved in a film I would consider a great movie. Car Wash comes close for me. Mm -hmm. But I don't think... Virginia Hill aside, which was just bland and cheap, every one of them has been interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Every one of them has had an interesting perspective or ideas or lines. And I'm really curious to see how well he builds on this getting into the next decade where he like fully finally has his feature directorial career. Right, right. And we still have a ways to go until Batman and Robin, so I'm hopeful. <laughs> Yes. 
And honestly, I'm going to be curious to even revisit the Batman movies with all of this leading up to it. Yeah, yeah, I think it'll be interesting to see, like, of all this, like, stuff we've kind of seen building over time, if that kind of changes my perspective on any of it. I don't know. I'm not expecting to suddenly love it. Yeah, yeah. But at least be kind of more at peace with it or understanding of it. Right. That's my hope. I was going to say, I feel like I need to watch some of the 66 Batman for a little while, too, before I watch it. Maybe that'll help, too. I don't know. Actually, that probably wouldn't be a bad idea since that's what he was going in for inspiration. Right. Watch the 66 movie. Oh, yeah, there you go. You know, but that's probably not a bad idea. Right. So <laughs> we still got a ways till we get there, though. Quite a ways, yes. So anyways, thank you again for joining me, Angie. Of course. Thank you. All right. Good night, everyone. Good night. For additional episodes or to leave a comment, please visit schumacast.blogspot.com. That's S-C-H-U-M-A-C-A-S-T dot blogspot dot com. Schumacast can also be found on Stitcher. Our opening song, Letter, and our closing song, Vein Blossom, were created by Jack Locke and are used with permission. To hear more, please visit jacklock.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. Schumacast is in no way affiliated with Joel Schumacher or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. <laughs>